Hello, and welcome to the Advancing Health Healthcare Innovation Show. I'm Michael Stamatinos, your host. And if you're new to us, super excited to have you here. We're incredibly passionate around healthcare innovation, adoption, access, and leadership. And if it's your first time tuning in, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about what we do here. So we're a healthcare innovation company. We're focused on bringing real stories of real people that are innovating within our space to life. And we just want to give them the opportunity and the platform to share their stories with the world. And we've got an amazing year that's been planned out, some incredible new content. So if you haven't checked out any of the historical interviews, make sure you hit subscribe now so that they come right into your inbox. And in today's episode, I had the exceptional privilege of hosting Terry Magro, who is the co-founder and vice president of the Michael Magro Foundation. And I've known Terry now for the better part of the last 15 years. And she's going to really, she's dedicated and passionate around helping families of children that have been diagnosed with cancer and her mission and the foundation's mission is really kind of pursuing not just the impact of raising funds and awareness, but also just by educating patients, families, teachers, physicians, and their respective communities about the intricacies of pediatric cancer care, its extensive effects and the long-term treatment. And Terry's just got an amazing story about can share the realities of, of cancer and the practical actions that can be taken and what the organization is doing today to really lighten the burden in families. So Terry, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, on being able to share our story, the mission, and, and how we do help these families. It's very grassroots, but it's very impactful. Yeah. So, so your, so your background, you're a clinician by trade. So, so you kind of went into this situation. Would you mind maybe even just sort of sharing with the, with our community a little bit about sort of your story, uh, the Michael Magla Foundation, the events that led up to its formation, and kind of go from there. Yeah. Good. Thanks. So, um, I, as Michael had mentioned, I'm a registered nurse and a nurse case manager. So I've been in the health field community since 1975. It's a long time. Um, and I always worked in adult surgery. So pediatrics was a very new venture for me. As a nurse, oftentimes you're taking care of the patients, you have them discharged, but you never know what the follow-up is. You never know what the dynamics and the psychosocial profiles are of a lot of these families until you get thrown into a situation like Paul, my husband, Paul, and myself got thrown into in 2004. So in 2004, my son, Mark, was 11 at the time, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, came out of absolutely nowhere. He was never sick a day in his life, all of a sudden presented with uh, some symptoms, bring him to the doctor, and boom, he's got this cancer diagnosis, which just threw us off uh, kilter a, a little bit, as you can well imagine. And Mark was going through cancer treatment at uh, what is now the NYU Langone Health System. It was Winthrop Hospital. We live in Hicksville, Long Island. Um, and he did he did pretty well. You know, he certainly had his uh, challenges and ups and downs, but never was admitted to the hospital. He was totally outpatient. A couple of months go by, and it's now uh, May, the end of May of 2004. And Michael was 13 and a half at the time. And he presented with um, flu-like symptoms, bring him to the doctor. Turns out he was diagnosed with a pneumonia and treating him for hmm, about a week with the pneumonia, it was getting worse instead of better. So I bring him back to the doctor and say, something's wrong. Can we repeat a chest X-ray? Can we see what's going on? That second chest X-ray started the whole ball. Um, it showed that he had a mass in his lung that wasn't a note noted um, on the first chest x-ray and they bring him into the hospital and diagnose him with ALL, which is a form of leukemia. Because he was 13 and a half, he was put into a very high risk group because of hormone uh, activity. So the good cells and the bad cells are multiplying at the same time. So now we have two boys in treatment. Um, just kind of, you know, took us way off our game. Fortunately, I was working for a company that allowed me to continue working, take my laptop. And at that particular junction in 2004, I had transitioned into medical sales. And Paul is a culinary instructor, a chef by trade, and then a culinary instructor. So he had the health benefits. It was now the end of June. So the school year came to an end. He had the time off and I was spending the time in the hospital with Michael. And he was bringing Mark back and forth to treatment. <clears throat> As we journeyed through this time, 
you get to talk to a lot of people and I'm finding as we're talking that people are having trouble paying their household bills. Their health insurance was covering a lot of medical expenses, but their household bills were falling between the cracks. So to fast forward, unfortunately, to July 30th of 2004, Michael passed away from multiple complications of his leukemia. So we all decided as a family that we would start a nonprofit organization and basically the mission is to help the families directly and the referrals would come from social workers. So we work now, we started out with one hospital and that was Winthrop's Cancer Center for Kids. And then we expanded to the other hospitals on Long Island, Stony Brook, Cohen Children, and then a couple in Manhattan. And now we're in about seven states. So our referrals come directly from social workers. They vet the families. And then they call us to let us to see if we're able to help them with, um, you know, with the bills that these people are ensuing. Mostly it's mortgage and rent, it's utility bills, telephone bills. Um, they scan the bills, they send them to us and we pay them direct. It's very helpful for these families, as you can well imagine, because some of them are at a, a junction where they're getting eviction notices, uh, they're repossessing their cars, because they cannot keep up with everything that's going on. Having a child in treatment, you cannot hold a full-time job. And now your expenses are higher and your salary is a lot less. So we jump in and do what we have dubbed as a life essentials program. And that's basically to help offset some of these bills, just to take them off their plate. And if they can just smile for a moment and just breathe and maybe have a night's rest because they're not worrying about somebody knocking on their door and telling them that they're getting this eviction notice. And this happens. We've seen it happen, you know, multiple times uh, where I'll call, you know, uh, utility companies in different parts of the United States and say, please, let me just put this on my credit card right, right now. I'm not even going to send a check because it's going to take too long. Don't repossess their car. We're talking to the insurance companies. Um, but I, you know, I intervene on behalf of these families um, and call a lot direct because the social workers don't have the time to do this. So I'm kind of their arm um, and we work again, with multiple health systems throughout the United States, it's all pediatric cancer, any type of pediatric cancer. We are, as Michael knows well, uh, an all volunteer board. There's no paid employees. Uh, we don't pay rent because we run out of my house. It's a computer and a phone you can take anywhere, right? Um, I had the very fortunate uh, opportunity to meet with Michael and his group uh, from MMU, and they run a soccer tournament for us every year. So fundraising is a very big piece of how we raise our money. Uh, and it's a third party, as you refer to as a third party fundraiser, because they take the entire fundraiser under their umbrella, and they organize the entire thing. And then they give us uh, a check at the end for the profits that were made from, from the, um, the game the soccer game and we're doing this now what 16 years michael yeah yeah 16 years going strong um, going strong thank yeah hey, thank you for the plug there um no I it's, it's that actually that's you know when we look to corporations and we look to people we look for partnerships um and it's it's not just you know Write, write us out a check. The whole idea is to partner with different organizations and different people that have influence in the community that will understand what our mission is. And our mission is really very simple. It's really just to help these families to get through. Uh, cancer treatment for pediatrics can go on for two, three years. Uh, it's, it's a long time to be out of work and trying to maintain a household in addition to the other children that are possibly involved in, in the family unit. So the whole family unit is kind of broken apart. Um, and we we want to try and help pull as much of it back together as possible. So we're always asking about the siblings in the family as well and being able to give them a gift card, uh, buy them something, see, see what they're all about because they're the ones getting kind of pushed around from grandma's house to a neighbor's house to a friend's house. And then they just want to go to Starbucks. They want to just go to a movie and... $25 here, $25 there sounds like nothing, but it's a lot when you have thousands and thousands of dollars uh, of bills that you're trying to pay at the same time and everybody's coming at you uh, with your deductibles and 
from the insurance and every other household bill that you have, and then physicians that may not be part of your plan that now you're paying, you know, for them as well. So it's, um, it gets, it, you know, it gets to be um, very cumbersome. And at the same time, you're walking with this child of yours that's going through treatment and maybe is having a very difficult time. Nine times out of 10, they are having a very difficult time. Um, they, you know, they, they try. Kids are the most resourceful people I've ever seen. Uh, they just, you know, they listen to the doctors, they listen to their parents, and they try the hardest that they can, but the medications are strong and they, you know, they cause a lot of side effects. And as a result of that, they're, they're kind of down. They lose a lot of muscle control. Sometimes pulmonary uh, symptoms pop up. There are secondary cancers that come from, you know, the cancer treatment. So we need the treatment, but you know, it also causes other, you know, other issues to occur. So we want to, we want to be able to help those people. We, we get testimonials and letters back from families all the time saying, you know, thank you so much. You, you don't even know who we are and you're here helping us when our families weren't even helping us uh, because they couldn't understand why we needed so much assistance when we had uh, all this insurance coverage and you try and explain to them, uh, I'm paying some of the medical expenses, some of the co-pays, things of that nature, pharmacy bills of meds that don't go through their insurance carrier, but it's everything else that's falling apart. And you're just trying to pull this uh, unit back together again, because this that's the strength that they need to rely on one another. Um, Having a nursing background is a big help, A, help working with the social workers, and B, just being there to talk to these families. And a lot of times the moms or the grandmas or the dads will call and say, do you have 10 minutes? I just need to talk to somebody who understands what we're going through. And so, you know, those 10 minutes always go on and on, which is fine, and multiple calls. And that's what I want. I want to be able to be there for them and give them the hope and the reality at the same time. You know, nobody's painting a, a very pretty picture here, but we want to be able to develop a rapport with these families and social workers so that they feel comfortable talking to us. What what kind of feedback do the do the social workers want from you after they've you've taken a referral? What's that communication look like? How do you kind of close that loop? And what have been some of the, the results of just communicating to them. Obviously, we know that sometimes these families are in a really difficult situation. The prognosis doesn't look, it yeah. looks pretty dim. Uh, but I guess how, how do you guys really uh, facilitate that and close the loop? Well, we, we close we close the loop with the social workers after, you know, some of these bills are paid, but that loop doesn't get closed right away because we're not a one and done organization. So they, they could need something three months later. They may need something three weeks later. Uh, so we're in constant communication with the social workers and the letters and some of the emails that the social workers send back to us, it's the family sending it to the social worker saying, you know, I can't thank that foundation enough. They truly understood what we're going through. They're non-judgmental, 100% non-judgmental. And they just paid not only the, you know, the cell phone bill that was behind, but they got us a month ahead. And the social workers really, really appreciate that because it it just gives them hope too that you know they they're reaching out and a lot of times they're getting doors closed and people saying no um a lot of smaller foundations we gross about 350 a year um but a lot of foundations in that category or or smaller or even a little bit larger have been struggling especially since covid so they are so grateful that we have expanded our wings, so to speak, and be able to help people in different parts of the United States. So they, um, they're probably our best advocates and ambassadors, the social workers, because they're a small group as well. You know, it's, it's always um, a networking group and they keep in touch with one another. So they'll share our social worker they know in a different part of the United States, or maybe in their state, but part of a different health system. Like we have multiple health systems in New York. There's multiple health systems all over the United States um, because they're so grateful. They, they, they.
and there's no oil in the burner and how is this child going to go home and uh, they'll end up catching pneumonia on top of everything else so it's you know it's things like that that you know we get back as feedback from the social workers that you know really really make us feel good uh, we have also... one family the toddler said to his mom oh my god we got a we have you got a, a gift card to stop and shop can we buy orange juice now you know it's like yeah. things you really take for granted and as we start talking to different, you know, different people, we align ourselves with a lot of other nonprofits. And at times they may be able, they have a budget that's larger than ours. Maybe they're a seven figure grossing organization. They can pay a couple of months worth of um, rent or mortgage. And then we'll pay the utility bill, the car insurance, the cell phone bill, things like that. So we do work in conjunction with a lot of other uh, smaller organizations as well. Um, the needs are just great. It's, you know, cancer is, it's, it's a lot of it. And it's very unfortunate, uh, you know, etiology unknown. So where, where do we go with that? They don't know. Is it genetic? Is it you know, environmental? Is it any one of a number of, uh, you know, yeah. number of, but how do, uh, how about the families? Do the families that you guys are taking care of and coming alongside of, do they well, talk about the social aspect of, of that? Do any of the families that Magro, that the Magro Foundation is, is, is supporting do they have an ongoing communication with one another what kind of bonds and friendships do they do they develop so that's a, that's a, that's a great point um quite a few of them have you know gotten out from under their child is out of treatment and they want to pay it forward so a lot of these families call us and they'll do you know a um uh, we do backpack drives and we do different drives for, you know, for arts and crafts materials and things like that for the kids. They'll say we were the recipients of a backpack. We were the recipients of a gift card to the gas station, um, to the grocery store, et cetera. Now I'm in a position with the company I work for to be able to do this for you. And they'll do their own campaigns and keep in touch with us on a regular basis um, to to be able to just help us be able to help families moving forward. They're not in a position to start their own organization, but they'll piggyback on to us and now and now pay it forward and give to us, which is great. And we do keep in touch with a lot of the families over uh, the course of years and see how they're tracking their progress. Or they'll call and say, I'm falling into a slump. I'm just, you know, uh, my own mind is going in a million directions. You know, just talk me through a few things. So we'll just sit and talk. Uh, um, just have general conversations to kind of bring them back a little bit to reality and engage them in what what is bothering them and you know how how can we get around this situation because they're afraid they're three years out from cancer treatment they're no longer on treatment but now they developed you know a, a cold and this cold became a pneumonia and their head just goes right to an oncology diagnosis so you know sometimes you just need somebody to ground you and so oftentimes the, uh, the parents will call and i'm the grounding person <laughs> Which uh, just you know say don't don't ignore the symptoms, but don't don't go into that really dark place. Let's let's just take it for for what it's worth. So uh, we have a lot of ongoing relations. Well, let's switch gears for a second. I want you to kind of maybe just kind of talk about Project Soar and what that what that looks like. So Project SOAR is our school reentry academic resource program. Um, this started with uh, the Cancer Center for Kids, where the boys were treated at uh, the old Winthrop, now NYU Langone Health uh, System, where these kids are on an outpatient basis for their treatment, but they may, um, they may be feeling well enough to go back to school or they may not. If they're feeling good enough to go back to school, the people that are most nervous is the school. So the kid wants to go back. All the child wants is to be a kid again. That's that they just want to be back in the game and they yeah. want to be a kid. And they're in third grade, fifth grade, kindergarten, high school, doesn't matter. They just want to get back and they want some form of normalcy. So the school reentry program we started basically links the Cancer Center for Kids clinical staff and psychosocial staff with the school. So we reach out to the parents and we say, 
you know, we want to we want to introduce this program where our psychologist, our um, nurse practitioner, our social worker, our child life specialist will go into the school on your behalf and speak about Johnny and his diagnosis. Once we have their permission and all the paperwork is signed, the team physically was going into the school until COVID, and then it was all done on Zoom. Now it's kind of resuming again, where they'll talk to the building principal, the gym teacher that the child has. The child and the parent is there as well, because we really want that interaction. So the kids are not nervous about Johnny coming back and let them know, let him do or she do as much as they possibly can. If they need to have a few extra bathroom breaks because of the medications they're taking, just let them get up and go without yeah. doing the whole passes and all this other stuff that would slow it down. Um, there's body image change, of course, so they may want to wear a baseball cap or a hat of some sort. Allow that, even though that's something you can't. So little things like that, up to and including the teachers or or somebody, the principal, the gym teacher saying, you know, I've been watching uh, this little guy for the past couple of days and he's off a little bit. I don't know what's going on, but let me reach out to the cancer center. So they have each other's phone numbers, texting, emails to say, I'm not sure what I'm seeing, but he's falling asleep. He's up and down a lot more, something, something's not right. This program has really facilitated a great uh, communication between the school and the cancer center, where then the cancer center will reach out to the uh, family and say, you know, we just got a, a phone call from the school. Um, they're concerned about something. So can you bring them in for a quick visit? Mm -hmm. They have picked up on a lot of things, these people in the schools. They they don't know what they're seeing, but they're seeing something and they're smart enough to know, let me bring this to the professionals. Uh, there's been some cardiac issues, respiratory issues that have occurred. And they basically have found when they did blood work or another chest x-ray or a follow-up of something that something was going on and then referred them to the cardiologist and started a different regime of treatment or maybe changed their chemo drugs around a little bit. So it's a great, great program. Uh, we've been funding this program since 2008. When you start with a lot of these drugs, some of these kids are on psychotropic drugs or they're on something from other things that have affected them. And now you're introducing all these chemotherapy drugs. So there are some interactions. There's some you know, transition of, of how everybody is going to do on all of these drugs now. So we do um, the, the uh, psychologist does a psychosocial profile and does a lot of testing with these kids. We underwrite that whole psychosocial profile that they do to see, is there a little ADHD going on? Is there something else happening? What, what's going on here? So they can monitor the meds, looking at it from a different perspective. Um, insurance companies traditionally don't always pay for these type of testing to be done. So when we come forth and say, we, we wanna do this neuropsych testing, um, the, the families are kind of great, you know, very grateful that somebody is doing something because they also know something's going yeah. on, but they don't yeah. want to say it. They don't want to, you know, they're like, oh, it's the meds. It's the, you know, the fear of the diagnosis. So we've, we've done a, a tremendous amount with that program. It's, it's a great program. You know, we talk a lot about access on the show and, you know, when, when, when people think about improving access, Mm -hmm. taking the, the notion that we can't afford this away, the people mm -hmm. start to kind of take advantage of some of these things that are out there. And the one thing that I love about Michael Magro Foundation is that you're radically transparent with <laughs> where the money goes. Yeah. And what was that sort of a, a virtue, a value that you felt was really important initially on as you started right. the foundation? A hundred percent. talk a little about that? A hundred percent. You know, as I mentioned, I had transitioned into medical sales. So I did that for like 25 years. And as a vendor to any hospital or, you know, physician, large physician practice, they were always trying to do something, raise money, have a gala at the hospital, all these other things. Um, and they would always come to us as vendors to help. And then you would try and go back and say, okay, you raised a million dollars, a half a million, whatever you raised, 200, whatever. Um, what are you doing with it? And 
you would never get a straight answer. And after a while, I was like, well, what am I funding here? I don't, I don't understand. What are, you, what are you doing with the money? Tell me where the money's going. So when we started this, that was so much in my mind that I said, from day one, we are going to tell these people what we made at every event and how we're spending the money. And at the end of every year, we do a pie chart now that we started that'll show 49% went to uh, paying mortgages, uh, you know, 15% went to car loans. It's all broken up by buckets to let people know there are no salaries involved. So 90 cents on a dollar goes right back into the foundation. But I think that is extremely important to know. We're not taking people on, um, you know, trips to, uh, to to have a board retreat. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm very much into the transparency of this is what the mission is. If I'm asking you to be an ambassador for us, then the least I can do is show you and tell you where the money is going. Um, and, and that's that's what people like, you know, whether it's we made sixty dollars or we made six thousand dollars, you're going to know it. You're, you're going to know it. And hopefully my expenses are low enough that um, we're making a heck of a lot more. And we are extremely fortunate, Michael, like people like yourself that, you know, underwrite a lot for us and donate a lot so that the profits from from the soccer tournament go directly to that. We have golf outings, we have tasting events. We do about six or seven events a year. So our the money we raise comes from fundraising, grant writing, and, and grant writing is, is a challenge, but, um, but nevertheless, there is grant money out there. So you just have to find the right fit. And it's the same thing now working with corporations and starting some sort of partnerships. Um, I wanna be able to develop uh, an awareness. I want you to understand what we're doing and have that awareness and, and be able to give you choices of, you know, how a company can get involved with a charity. Um, there's, you know, a lot of talk of corporate social responsibility. So what exactly is that? That's, you know, making, making a difference in the community by aligning yourself with the charity. And that could be direct donations. And of course, the easiest and the quickest way is writing a check out. But that's also, you know, sometimes just leaves a little like, okay, what, what are we doing here? Where is this money going? So we, you know, we want to be able to have you involved with maybe doing a third party event, um, having a matching program. A lot of companies have matching programs, but the employees don't even realize that. And if they were buying tickets to an event or they're helping make a donation, they can uh, solicit the company to assist in that. There are employee giving days, which is great, where they can do the backpacks. And we do these things called distraction bags for the kids when they're waiting to go for a procedure or have um, an OR, you know, have, have to go to the operating room for day op or coming out of anesthesia and they're anxious. And so these, you know, they're like string bags, but they're full of crayons and coloring books and stickers and Play-Doh and, you know, different little portable games and arts and craft things that can just take their mind off of it. So now they have to wait two hours before they can get discharged. They're anxious. They want to get out. They already had the procedure done. Kids are so, you know, they just jump right out of the bed and yeah. they're ready to go. But clinically, you can't discharge them yet. So if you kind of occupy them a little bit, they calm down. And it's it's a great feeling. But people can put these things, you know, together. Um, there are lots of um HR programs that companies have where you can have direct, you know, withdrawals coming and donations on a monthly, quarterly, whatever basis uh, you want. But we we want to we want real partnerships with the companies that that are working with us. We want them to have a passion for what we do. We want them to be ambassadors. Um, God forbid they have any connections of people that need our our service. Uh, then then we're there for them. Uh, you know, we want to we want to design these programs to to inspire these people to work with us and to share what we do with other companies and say, you know what, this company is very transparent, as you first mentioned, um, you really should give them a look. You know, they're small, yeah. but they're big, but they're powerful. Yeah, just even to kind of bring it full circle, you know, we talked about the soccer tournament and you know, one of our one of our members uh, owns and runs a soccer club in Long Island, and one of their kiddos uh, had gone through an unfortunate circumstance, and and I just remember texting you and say, "Hey, can you help this kiddo?" And you said, "Sure, yeah, of course we can." And mm -hmm. just little things like that, being able to be able to provide 
a level of dignity to the family, to the siblings, and a bit of normalcy, especially during a time that's just really unclear, uncertain. So, um, you know, we're kind of running towards the end of our time here. And, mm -hmm. and I just want to also just note, so if there's, I know that there's an enormous amount of work that still needs to get done and there's, it's never going to get done. Um, what does a bigger impact look like for the Magler Foundation? Kind of to describe to us future state of what the Magler Foundation could potentially do and what does that look like? And then the second part to that question is, is what do you need right now to try to make that happen? So I would love in the next couple of years to be able to double and triple the amount of families that we help um, and the amount of dollars that we bring in. So, you know, immediately, uh, you know, as you said, keeping keeping their lives with dignity and being able to help them so that they're not struggling, losing, you know, homes, et cetera. Um, the immediate would be, you know, some nice corporate donations. Um, but in addition to that, again, would be the companies understanding what we do and and following us and, you know, following us on LinkedIn and reaching out to some of the other uh, potential donors that they may know. So utilizing their network to help grow our, our foundation and our mission. Uh, 350000 sounds like a lot of money uh, and it helps a lot of people. But now the needs are coming in every day. We get five and six requests for um, for bills to be paid. And it's not just one bill, it's multiple bills. So I have to pick and choose some of those. I would like to just be able to say to the social worker, I'll cover them all. So maybe all those bills was $5,000. I can't do that right now. I can only do a portion of it up to maybe 2,500 because I'm, you know, it's like the fishes and the loaves of bread. I'm trying to stretch it out to be able to give a little bit to everybody. Um, ideally, my, you know, my goal would be to be able to say, let me pay for two months of your rent or your mortgage. Let me get you ahead of the curve on your credit card bill or something. Because medical expenses and deductibles go on those credit cards, right? When you first Absolutely. are diagnosed and you haven't met your deductible and, you know, it could be a $5,000 deductible. So now your credit card just got hit with $5,000. So if it's a medical expense or it's a deductible for an insurance uh, claim, uh, payments, that we will help with. I'm not helping with all sorts of other things, but we we do, you know, help with those uh, those types of things. I'm not paying for their dinners necessarily and things like that. But with that being said, we spend, you know, five to six thousand dollars every six weeks on uh, gift cards and we bring those gift cards to the social workers and they dispense them to the families. And that's to the food store, the grocery stores, Walmarts, Targets, gas stations, wh whatever. And they they help them. Parking alone, Michael, can cost people three hundred, four hundred dollars a month. Uh, easy. Uh, in Manhattan, yes. it's probably a week. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's now you're not working or you're working less, you're bringing in less and now you're paying $400 to park your car in Manhattan. It's like, it's crazy. It's like what something's got to give. So, you know, my wish uh, would be to be able to help those people pay all of those things off and not have to worry about every little thing. Let them focus on their children, both the, the sick child and and the other children that are kind of getting pushed aside a little bit when they just want to go to Starbucks and they need twenty five dollars to have, you know, uh, go with their friends and have you know a day or two at Starbucks just to enjoy themselves. Twenty five dollars sounds like nothing, but it's big. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. Um, people can donate gift cards. Uh, if it's gift cards, then it's usually like Amazon. Visa, things that are more generic, Uber, a lot yeah. of Uber cards um, that we can send to anybody anywhere. Because again, we're in so many states, so uh, you know, it, it, it can't be very specific. But that's kind of what um, I would like to do as I build rapports with people to say this, this is what we're doing and find what makes sense to them. You know, the, yeah. the missions have to align. The ideas have to align. If they say they can do something different, let's talk about what that different is. I'm very open. Amazing. Uh, so listen, Terry, it's been, it's been incredible to have you on the show. You've been someone that I've admired, you know, one of those leaders that just gets things done, no nonsense, tells it how it is, mm -hmm. and yet you have a kind, compassionate, caring heart. So for those 
that have been listening in to our community, I think the ask is, is if, you know, for me, it's, if you found this interview compelling, if you found this conversation, something that's sort of tugged at your heartstrings, share it on social media, make a comment. How can you use your time, talents, and treasures to, to advance, especially, you know, helping kiddos? Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm at my best when I'm serving alongside you and the rest of my peers at the tournament every single year. I look forward to it and we will continue to look forward to it. And we're making an impact. It's nice to be able to, to say that we've done this. It is. It really makes a difference. So for those that are in our community, yeah, share it. We always want more people to kind of come in. We talk about innovating within healthcare. Innovation doesn't have to be something that's grand and technological. It can be something as simple as how do you improve health? Maybe it's paying someone's bill because it takes that stress off of them. I would venture to say that that is absolutely improving someone's health. We're improving family's health. So great to see you, Terry. Look forward to catching up with you shortly. And Thank we'll you. always welcome you to come back on the show. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity. You Bye. Bet.